new Photic Realm announcement. Uh, submission windows for upcoming issues. Issue 10, the theme is justice. That's hard-boiled fiction with a supernatural twist. The deadline for that will be April 1st, 2020. Issue 11, the theme is kaiju. Giant monsters terrorizing civilization. Deadline will be October 1st, 2020 for those stories. Issue 12, the theme is lycanthropy, which is, of course, self-explanatory. Um, <laughs> it can be any type of animorph with a bloody twist. Uh, so I guess that's werewolves and Jesus, giant, I don't know. What do people turn into? Seals? I've just got a little seal on my desk, so I thought of that. I don't know. You have to be more imaginative than I just was. Uh, but the deadline for lycanthropy, January 1st, 2021. Good luck to everyone submitting. is Austin James Hatch. Uh, he's been on four some years ago when his first book came out with Nihilism Revised. Now he's back with a new collection of poetry called Shrapnel, which is based on some very personal experiences that he details in our chat. Really appreciate Austin coming on and, and being so forthright with me. If you yourself want to be on the show or if you want to tell me something about it, you can always do so using losingthepluppodcast.gmail.com. I look forward to hearing from you. So my intro chat. So here is my conversation with Austin James Hatch. So I saw on Skype that it's been like a last time we talked was 10th of June 2018. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's good to be back. First of all, thanks for having me. You know, we chatted right after my first book came out. Um, it was kind of a bizarro collection. It was a kind of, I guess it would be a short, that one was a short novella with some stories tacked on the back, mm-hmm. um, which was awesome. It was, it was great timing. Cause like say, I think that was literally like two days after the story or the book released, nice. but yeah, it has been a long time. Um, what are the main things you've been up to in the last year or two years? Anything big changing? <laughs> well, <clears throat> so you know, in 20, I guess the for the first year, that's the second and part of 2018 and the first part of 2019, I was just writing, writing a lot, you know, um, have a, another story, a short story collection that, that we put out and then I've uh, taken some classes. I, I'm fortunate to take some online classes with some excellent writers that I admire. Um, so that was good. I got a little stockpile of stories, but but then in August of 2019, my mom passed away unexpectedly. Uh, got a call like four o'clock in the afternoon when I was leaving work, and uh, she was she was an emergency heart surgery. And then I was the only person that could make it to the hospital, um, the only person close enough. And it was it was tough, you know, because like it was one of those things that hits you so fast, you don't really know what's going on drive up to the hospital it was a couple hours away so there's time you know your mind's just trying to figure out what's happening you know <clears throat> about halfway there I was getting some updates kind of through my sister who had been talking to the hospital and she's in San Francisco so she was kind of trying to that's the only way she could even be in touch about halfway there was when you know some of the details that were adding up that I started to realize that she may not make it she might not make it out of that and she didn't. So it was, it was extremely surreal because, uh, you know, I'm at the hospital. We were in the same room, obviously, with her after she passed. She just never made it out of surgery. 
but then I'm here. I am at like one, two in the morning, making the calls, you know, telling people, family members who were all already aware she was in the hospital at that point, but I had to be the, the messenger of that particular bad news. And then, mm. and then it was just a, <clears throat> just one of those things you're kind of in shock, you know, you didn't, I didn't really feel it for a while, you know, I, so before you, for me, before having gone through that kind of loss, you kind of assume it's going to hit you fast and you're going to, you're going to like mourn and cry and get all that stuff and then go through all that pain. But I didn't, I didn't at first, um, which was really weird for me because then I'm going through this kind of thing where I'm like, well, shouldn't I be sad and, and realizing that I'm going to be sad and I'm just going to hit me all at once and it's going to, I'll be in the middle of the day or something at work and it's just going to hit and destroy me. You know what I mean? I was kind of pre not prepared, but expecting that, you know, and then um, about six weeks later, my ex-wife and I separated. Um, it had nothing to do with the death of my mother. We're still actually really good friends. It was just kind of, uh, I realized when my mom was gone, I just wasn't particularly happy with my life. I mean, I had a good job, I have amazing kids. Um, and, you know, we talked it through and she had been feeling the same way. I think in reality, our marriage had been over for probably three years. We just didn't ever accept it, you know, or didn't want to accept it. And then with that, I ended up relocating to to be closer to my kids because they moved back to, to where my ex-wife is from. And that was all over the course of like two months. And that's a lot to go through. And it was about that time. So probably in like November, it was about the time when it all hit. And that's when things got really rough. You know, I'm in a new place. I don't really know anybody. I have a new job. I have... Uh, my kids are don't live with me anymore and they're going through some obviously the struggles of their parents divorcing and that's when I was you know felt really really alone you know, I don't have my mom anymore you know the thing about your mom is no matter what you're always special to her you're always important to your mom uh, more so than probably anybody else alive and there's times I wanted to call her and tell her something which um, didn't happen often like my mom and I didn't talk every day but it was nice you always have your mom to call maybe not everybody but I always had my mom to be able to call and be like hey this happened to me today and she'd at least pretend to care <laughs> you know so um, so it's pretty dark it's a dark time and that's really what r led into my most recent uh, book which is a collection of poetry yeah. called it's called shrapnel and uh, because you got me started talking i'm just going to keep going i'm going to ramble until you tell me to stop <laughs> all right it's my job easy cool. yeah there you go <laughs> but, but so that december december of 2019 and january of uh 2020 was really where i was probably the darkest spot of my adult life and uh i i wrote a lot of very raw poetry i mean most of the poetry in that book has not changed from the second I wrote it. Yeah. Um, it was just, I didn't edit it. Po poetry I'd written previous, you know, you go over and make a lot of drafts and try to make words just right. And this was just like this onslaught. I was writing two, three poems a day and uh, just made this collection. There was even a couple of times when I was like, okay, I'm done. I can't write any more of this stuff because I've changed, you know, I've gotten this all out of my system. The tone of the poetry is changing. Like three days later, be like, well, actually, I'm gonna add a few more to this collection. <laughs> you know, um, it's interesting, and there's actually a poem in there about it. But it was interesting because, like, I started writing poetry. So I guess to backtrack a little bit, I hadn't been writing at all since my since my mom died. I didn't write anything. I was in the middle of working on a novella that I think I still think has a lot of potential, but I, I didn't. I quit writing. I was just not in a spot to be able to do that. My I needed that break, I guess. So I kind of forced myself to write this poem um, that had been going, you know, some of the lines had kind of been going through my head and I took some notes on it here and there. And when I wrote it, like another one came out and another one came out and it, it messed me up. Like it, it really 
hit me hard, hit my emotions hard, which I kind of took as a sign that it was working, you know. <laughs> it's supposed to do that. Um, but yeah, that's so that's kind of where shrapnel came from. And then I tack on, in the very back, there's, I think I had eight previous poems that had been published. I threw those in there just so I had a you know, complete collection. And then I had another, I think, seven that are also basically unchanged from when I wrote them when I was like, uh, you know, 19, early 20s, something like that. Yeah. And, and, uh, I refurbished them a little bit as I re as I put them actually on a computer because I was taking them from my notebook, you know, I put them on, uh, put them on the computer. And as I typed them, there's a little bit of wording I changed, but for the most part, all that was the same. So, so really in the book, everything, but the stuff that's actually reprints is probably, 90% exactly what I wrote the first time, um, which is new for me, you know? Um, and when you've written these poems, like, do you, do you know what they mean? Or are they just getting, like, anything that was in your head out, or? <clears throat> yeah, it was basically just whatever was, whatever emotions I was feeling. So, yeah, there's, yeah, I had a lot of emotions. Um, I had emotions about my mother being gone and about, the things that my kids were going through and the things that, uh, you know, the guilt, a lot of guilt involved in all these things. Yeah. And, uh, and, and then there were, um, you know, certain things or certain, um, you know, maybe there was relationship things from the past that I had not necessarily dealt with, like way past before marriage, people had broken my heart or something. There's a lot of the stuff that was coming out and it was just being, you know, so, so each one kind of coerced, kind of already just came out as what, as it was, and it was just kind of uh, cohesive with itself about whatever topic it was about. But, you know, overall, it wasn't a lot of premeditation. It was just, it was just, I had to, I had to write. I was, I was basically bleeding my guts out on these pages, you know. So it's really not been that long. No, no. I mean, I finished writing it up, writing most of those um, about a year ago, you know. Yeah. Um, and uh, and it helped, you know. Obviously, I'm not in, or obviously, I was in an extremely dark place then. Um, but I, uh, life is quite a bit better now. A year, year goes by, and I've healed and adapted to my new world, and my kids are doing better, and, and um, you know, things like that. Is also up against some bankruptcy issues that we should honestly should have just filed bankruptcy and divorced, but we didn't. Uh, but you know, since then, like last spring or whatever, we were able to get all that taken care of. So yeah, a lot of positive changes. You know, right now, I would say that aside from not being with my kids every single day, um, I'm the happiest I've I've been in my adult life. Wow! Did you? A year ago, did you think you would be seeing that now? Yeah, I mean, I knew I'd get through it, right? I mean, um, you have to, we're humans, that's what we do. We, we evolve and adapt. And that's, just, that's just it. You know? And I guess I got to a point where I said, and I think actually these lines made it into one of my poems as well, where I said that uh, I either had to grow or I had to die. And I wasn't particularly fond of either idea, so I had to grow by default, you know. So in what ways do you think you've grown? Man, I, uh, I honestly, I feel like a completely different person. I'm not even really sure how to define all that. I mean, you know, I am certain that I can live through anything or survive everything, you know. For me, before going through, uh, tragedy, I, I guess, would be the best way to explain it. Before going through that stuff, it, it was always kind of a maybe a nightmare or something that you don't know if you could ever get through something. You know, I mean, I never thought about it in this exact scenario, but you know, if you tell somebody that, hey, you're going to, your mom's going to die unexpectedly, you're going to get divorced, and you're going to have to relocate, you're not going to be in the same town as your children. Uh, you can have a new job. You're not going to have any friends there. And you're also going to be so far in debt that you can't even see, you know, see through it. 
I mean, that's some scary shit. You, you know, that's something that's without having experience. It's like, man, I don't know if I can survive that kind of stuff. But you can. But I did, and I and you people do. Humans go through this and worse. So, you know, I think overall, um, I, I just I think overall, knowing like I've been through some some hard things now, some extremely hard things. It's kind of like that saying that you see on Facebook or whatever that I actually really like is you survived 100% of all your bad days. And I still have, and I've had even worse days now, right? So there's a, there's a piece of strength and maybe peace of mind that comes with that to some degree. You know, I, <clears throat> I kind of took it as a time to, for transformation. I needed to... I knew at the time that I needed to, uh, there's things about me that were going to change regardless. Um, so other than, you know, the struggle of all that stuff hitting me and being able to go through it, um, I mean, I knew in the long run it would be positive, you know, especially like divorce. You don't ever get a divorce not planning on it being in the long run for the good, you know, I mean, so you don't be like, oh, I get divorced so that my life can suck worse for the rest of my life. <laughs> and then also, um, like, I, I think it's quite, I don't, I don't know, but I assume it's quite typical that um, you, it's hard to say that you knew you had to get divorced. So, like, looking back, maybe it's easy to say that, you know, you said three years. But if you've been in, if this is like the longest relationship you've been in or the longest marriage, maybe you think, oh, this is just like the long, this is just the long dip period. They just get longer. No. Yeah, there's there's some of that, but you know, I think ultimately what it came down to is we were always really just friends. We were just friends. Um, you know, we made we we lived life together for a while. We made some beautiful children. Obviously, always going to be a very important person to me. Uh, but we were roommates, and I think both of us. I do. I know. I keep saying. I think. I know both of us realized that somewhere along the line that there actually wasn't. Uh, there wasn't necessarily enough there. You know, I mean, I'm confident. I'm absolutely confident we could have worked through it and made it work and continued to be together. But that wasn't what either of us actually needed. Yeah. So that's that's kind of where that part of it came from. And, and like I say, we're still really close. We talk multiple times a week. Um, I get my kids. Uh, actually, it's, I'm supposed to get them like every other weekend, but I have them pretty much every weekend. And we work together really well. You know, my my uh, each of my kids have had their unique struggles with this, which makes sense. Um, and that's the other type of stuff you can't really prepare for. But we've worked really well together to help them grow and get better. And it's always going to be something that kind of uh, will, will impact their lives. Obviously, it's a defining moment for all of our lives. It's, uh, yeah. but um, but it is it's. For a while there, it was really, really rough. They were, they were struggling a, a lot. And of course, it just uh, it just made my personal struggles a lot harder, too. How does it, like, so you, you got a separation soon after your mother passed away, and then were you just mostly grieving alone, or...? Yeah, so, well, I mean, I moved in with, when I, when I first moved to Boise, which is where I live, <laughs> by the way. Um, okay. Which for for you who's on the other side of the world, that's in Idaho, which is technically a part of the United States. <laughs> no, um, but you know, my uh, I, I had a cousin here, or I have a cousin here, um, and so to help me out a little bit financially, I moved in with her for a couple uh, a couple months. She had an extra room, um, and that was until we could sell the house that we had. Because I moved here from Utah, so that was another thing: is getting a house sold and all those types of things. So we had enough money to, both me and my ex-wife had enough money to kind of settle some of our debts and then um, not to get into, uh, you know, apartments and things like that. So, you know, I, I had that support, you know, and then work was very, very supportive. You know, they understood what I was kind of going through. Um, and then, yeah, I had a few friends, uh, some friends from like high school that I don't necessarily talk to every day, but. Uh, we kind of reconnected during that time. Um, you know, my my uh, ex mother in law was still still is, but uh, but was very open 
and, and able to help me out a little bit. And there's a few others, but you know, the, the picture in my mind is that, uh, and I say a few others, I mean, I had like amps and my grandma and stuff like that, but all of that was long distance. You see what I mean? So yeah. like the grief that I felt was, yeah, it was me alone. It was me alone in my, my townhouse on the couch with my laptop just chugging words out onto this thing and then binge watching shows and um, learning, realizing that I just have to get through today because tomorrow will be different. I'll be different. Um, you know, and another thing that I learned through all that is, you know, most of my life I've struggled with anxiety and depression and those types of things. But I've also learned that most of my life I have come to associate a lot of negative feelings as anxiety and the thing that's interesting about anxiety to, to me and i think to, to others who who have a lot of anxiety is that part of the anxiety is the panic that you are starting to feel anxiety and all that does of course is just exponentially make it grow into something you can't control um, but i kind of learned that that feeling, the, the whatever feeling, uh, whatever feeling it is, I've got a lot of ways I've tried to describe it, but not in words, not in not in spoken words. Um, isn't always anxiety. So here's here's an example. Uh, one afternoon, I felt very anxious, and I had that that ball in the pit of my stomach. You know, there's that ball of ugliness or whatever it was, and I'm like, I'm about to have a panic attack, which is horrible. If you haven't had one of those, don't. Not recommended. <laughs> um, and you know, because I did have have a few of them during this this time. And it sucks. I got my kids. I'm like, I can't have a panic attack with my kids. Like, they can't. I have to be able to be here for them. I can't. I can't go lay in bed and do nothing and freak out and all this stuff. So anyway, I thought that was happening, and I ended up going into the bathroom and locking myself in there, and I cried. I cried for. I don't know, maybe it was only like five minutes. And then I felt better. And I was fine. And so that's when I kind of realized, well, wait a second, that feeling that I had that I've always associated with anxiety and then potentially panic attacks. In this case, that same feeling was I just needed to go cry in the bathroom for a few minutes, which I don't believe is anxiety or, or panic attack, if that makes sense. So that was another thing that's helped me grow. You know, I've done a lot of personal growth through all this. Um, yeah, you. I guess you get forced to get in touch with your emotions when they become unavoidable. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and I've had some counselors. Um, I'm not currently seeing any, but I, I have often on my whole life. And I think counselors, even if you don't, even if you feel great about your life, just help put things in perspective are amazing. It's an, it's an amazing thing. Uh, and I, I do plan on using counselors my whole life. But anyway, I had one that was like, he'd say this, the way that he said them, he'd say the easiest things was blow my mind. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. um, and he it was actually called existential therapy. But there were things like, you know, he's like, well, hey, just because you start feeling this anger that you have for this uh, ex-girlfriend or whatever it was, um, doesn't mean you have to dwell on it. Like you can literally be like, oh, hey, there's that anger again and dismiss it and move on. And I'd heard these things before, but uh, like the way, the timing of it and the way that he said it was just like a revelation to me. Like, you mean I can literally just be like, huh, interesting, I'm feeling this again and then not feel it anymore or not, it, not acknowledge it and dwell on it? You know, it's like, wow. Silly little things like that. <laughs> you know, and when I say ex-girlfriends, I did have some, uh, not directly after the divorce, but, well, I guess it was. It would have been directly after the divorce, but not directly after the separation. So a few months later, I had some, just some flings, things that didn't work out. Other, most of them were also damaged and vulnerable and kind of in the same spot that I was at. Um, but the, the way people react to certain things, you know, like um, having a, have, being close with somebody and having a sexual relationship that's getting started up and then they just disappear on you. you know, it's just gone. 
and you never hear from them again. You can't get a hold of them. Uh, you know that brings up a lot of a lot of anger, and uh, you know obviously you start wondering what's wrong with me. Why why can't I get this to work? And then on top of that, you're going through a lot of the same feelings you may have from divorce and all that other things too. So. So yeah, I do have a lot of poems in my book that are are kind of about some of those yeah. those types of scenarios that I have nothing really to do with or nothing to do with my ex-wife or uh, most of them or some of them are newer and some of them are older. But anyway, it's easy to connect with your poetry because I think these are all very human things that we worry about. Um, yeah, you know, I always look back on like. The friends I still have and the friends I don't have, and I I always wonder like, do I have enough? Do I have less than other people? Do I have more than other people? Like when people stopped getting in touch with me, was that deliberate or did I do something or am I happy that they didn't? Um, oh it's, yeah, it's like there's no way of knowing. Um, or may, or maybe there is. Maybe other people know. No, I doubt they do. But it, it's so human to to wonder. You know, and then like, do you? If somebody is just going to drop out your life like that, did you did you care? Are you glad for it? Instead, I mean, I don't know. yeah, well, yeah, exactly, right. So then you have this thing where logically you're like, well, good. I don't mm -hmm. if they're going to be this type. I don't need that type of person in my life. Yeah, but then, but emotionally, for at least for a little bit, it doesn't feel that way at all, right? It feels like, mm -hmm. oh my god, I'm alone again, or man, I really thought she was different, some special or, you know, whatever. Um, and then and then you will start wondering, or I start wondering, like, well, have there been times that I have completely dropped out of somebody's life like this without realizing it? Yeah. You know, I don't have a lot of close friendships. I just, I never really have. Um, but is some of that because I unintentionally end up ghosting people without realizing or whatever maybe not exactly but you know what i mean you start having those types of thoughts it's interesting yeah yeah it's all part of being an adult i mean i remember um when, when you get out into the adult world and then you're like why does not why do people not care as much about me as like the people i grew up with like my parents and my brother and sister or whatever um the wider world just doesn't and that's like when you lose those people it's like yeah that feeling like that feeling of being made to feel special has gone with them because other people won't do that and um and it, it, like it never stops being surprising to me sometimes i'm just like when are they all going to realize how special i am <laughs> it's so stupid well yeah exactly but we probably guess that's part of growing up right part of the human thing is understanding that your own self-worth is more important than anybody else's view of you to, yeah. to some degree so my ex-wife is still really, really close with her family and friends she grew up with. She has, like, she talks to her mom every day type of scenario. Like, they'll live very close to each other. Uh, I mean, like, same town and stuff, you know. Um, and that's just, like, complete opposite of, of me. Like, you know, I mean, I'm, I, was, I was close to my mom. I'm close to my dad, but I don't talk to him every day. You know, I'm, I am the type of person that can go, like, with my mom, and I could go, two months without even talking to her or texting her or anything. And she was the same way. And then it would just be like a text of once like, oh, hey, thinking of you, here's a fun little meme, you know? Yeah. And that was fine, but it was a lot different because I don't have any, really any childhood friends. I have some, you know, but not close to my cousins. And and, uh, and a lot of that is me and my personality um, because I have cousins that, I mean, like, it's not that any of them don't want to necessarily be close to me, and it's not that I'm like, oh, I don't want to be close to you. It's just not a part of my my life, really. And I don't have. I sound like a monster as I say this. I guess I'm not particularly motivated to make them a part of my life, and that's um, that's sad. Well, yeah, but it's kind of sad in a way, you know. Um, you know, I just had the same conversation with my sister earlier today. She couldn't believe that some people went to the same high school as her, bought a house in that same area, married somebody they went to school with, like, then sent their own kids to that same school, um, and were satisfied with that. I can be envious of people who are 
I guess so easily satisfied, but if it's not for you, it's not for you, and you've got to do your own thing, and it doesn't make you a monster, it means that you operate differently from other people. Yeah, it's, again, self-work is more important than than the monsters. <clears throat> They're the monsters, they want me to be friendly. <laughs> yeah. What do you mean you want to talk to me more than once every six months? <laughs> what did you even, yeah, what did you even do? Like, I don't understand, or like, um, now that I get to work from home and I don't have to go into the office, it's like, thank God, like, I talked to you yesterday. What do you think I did? I, I joked around earlier because I always say happy holidays at Christmas and New Year's. and um, But I've said that, you know, before, like, some people don't like to say Christmas because of the religious, you know, undertone yeah. or overtone. But um, I... I've never said happy holidays because of that. I, I realized this year that I literally only say happy holidays because there's two so close to each other and I don't want to say it again. <laughs> like, I don't want to tell you Merry Christmas and then Happy New Year. I just want to say happy holidays, hope you have a good holiday, something like that. And that's the end of it. Like, I, I've already said it, I'm done. That's the kind of person I am. <laughs> <laughs> um, tell me about why it was important for you to include the portrait of your younger self do you see that there's some sort of connection between is it like a different era of despair maybe oh absolutely yeah, yeah yeah you know some of that well yeah so i wrote a lot of poetry when i was younger high school and early 20s um and the poems the seven that made it into the book are the only good ones <laughs> but uh yeah you know so i have a whole bunch of stuff with my teenage angst and all the things you're going through at those times and then even you know early 20s you go, you're going through a lot you're still figuring out who you are i mean i think you're be honest with you, i think you're figuring out who you are your whole life to some degree but because who you are changes but um especially in early 20s like you're starting to get out and you're you know you've been on your own for a couple of years and paying rent and then you're having um relationships where you, you can live with each other whereas in high school that's probably not as feasible yeah. <laughs> you know so so i just looked back at some of those times and well I, actually so this this goes back uh this actually goes back even farther so um early 2019 i think it would have been I, w I went through all my old poetry notebooks every single one of them and the ones that I thought were good, I took a picture of and put them on my phone just because I wanted to like have that copy. I still have my poetry notebooks, but I was like, oh, this is pretty good. You know? um, and so as I'm writing this poetry and I'm like, the things I'm going through and some of it feels very similar. It feels different. It, it, it was kind of more of a, I don't know. I don't want to say a real world. It's a more mature version, I guess, because, or or maybe... Maybe mature is not the right word, but <clears throat> regardless of what's happening, the, a lot of the feelings were the same. Uh, some of them were new, but a lot of the feelings were the same. And it just occurred to me, like, hey, I want to look at those pictures on my phone because at, at this point, all my crap's in storage, you know. And uh, of the ones I thought were good, I think there were eight. And I uh, originally was going to have all eight in there, and and. <clears throat> I one of them I decided as I was typing it up actually I don't like this poem and when I say good I, I honestly I don't give a shit if, if it's good I don't care if my work is good um, I want it to be the best that I can make it so I want to feel like it's good I don't care what people think of it to some degree like I want people to want to publish it and want to read it but that's all you know that's all kind of a byproduct of, of my stuff so I, I've been saying my old poetry good I should say the old poetry that I felt like still still apply it still resonated something that i can still look at freaking almost 20 years later which i hate to say and uh and be like okay that still applies more so than just being nostalgic you know what i mean because most of my when you, when you go back as a human when you go back and look at all this stuff from when you were in high school or whatever it's like there's nostalgia there and it's real and you're like i didn't even like being in high school i didn't even like any of this time but this is really cool but I like it now, you know, which is weird. But uh, but yeah, so so those were things that there was more feeling left over than nostalgia, I think, is the way to put it. And I never thought of it until we just talked about it right now. But um, yeah, you know, and so it is kind of interesting. I, I, the way that 
I've, the way that that book is set up, the way shrapnel is set up, I have all of my new, really raw, gritty, dirty, whatever you want to call it, poetry all front. And then I have those seven pieces, and I think they're just called, uh, they're in a little section called um, Refurbished. And then after that, there's the reprints, because I kind of, like I said, when I felt like, well, hey, I do have some other poems that I, I like. They've been reprinted. I'll stick them in the back. The feeling is so much different between all three sections. And the first section is, you know, two-thirds, 75% of the book. And it's, it's kind of funny the way that this worked out, because I've looked at the book multiple times. Uh, I don't usually read my old work, and um, I, I've dabbled at reading some of this stuff. But, uh, like, it's it's interesting if you were to kind of think about the order of those poems, the, the, po the way that that was ordered, the whole, the whole first section. There was no, like, rhyme or reason to it. It's literally in alphanumeric order, which is a weird way to say numbers in an alphabet. But um, that, because I, that's how I combined them into a document. And that was it. That's all I cared. I wasn't like trying to be artistic or strategic about where stuff fit. And then you get to the last little chunk of those poems and it stops being that way. And that's because those were the poems I wrote after I was done. I was done with it. Here's my, uh, you know, here are my poems for this collection. I'm done because my poetry is changing and it doesn't have the same feel that I want. And, uh, and like, actually these ones do, I like when I slapped them on the back, you know? So it's kind of funny because like it starts with a poem that is pretty, uh, it's not even really a poem. I think it's just a list of some of the shit that it was like being there when mom died and, and may having to be the guy who makes a decision about, you know, where's my mother going to be cremated? Somebody has to make a decision because this is, you have to be prepared to make a decision, which you can't really be prepared for. Uh, I guess you can, but I wasn't. Um, and so I, th one of the first poems is a list of 10 things that I, that I kind of experienced at that time. And since, since then I've read it and it's like, that's actually really powerful for me. And maybe it is a good opener or one of the first ones. Yeah. It seemed like, it seems like a chosen opener to me. Yeah. It's not, <laughs> it's literally just by the title. It's literally by the title, but that's, that's kind of how this whole thing was to be honest with you. Um, and it, it was just literally me throwing stuff up throwing stuff out there and not worried about order, not worried about any of it. And my publisher, uh, Don, Donald Armfeld, Armfield, um, was very gracious and, and very patient with me because I'd send him that, like say, I sent him that document and then later on sent him more. I'm like, I'm just kidding. I need more of this, you know, and, uh, and loved the way it was set up. Because uh, we originally discussed uh, maybe breaking it out into additional sections or whatever. And I was just like, the point I was at, I was like, dude, that's all up to you. <laughs> you can do whatever you want with stuff. I'm just getting this stuff out, and I'm pleased that you're interested in actually publishing this. And uh, and and so it, it was. It's interesting because he had it the exact same order I had it, which I, should mean that he liked it, you know. Um, and then you know, while I've got you, and I'm kind of talking about what he's got going on. If you don't mind, I'm gonna do a little bit of a shout out. He. Um, so Donald Arnfield, I've been, I've had the, the honor of being published alongside him in a couple of anthologies. You know, I learned of him through <clears throat> publisher Nihilism Revised, who published my first book that we talked about a year and a half ago. And uh, um, and so when I started writing these, these poems, and I had a little collection. I was like, huh, I wonder if anybody would be interested in reading any of this stuff. And I uh, I knew that he was a poet, and you know, long story short, I found out that he was starting up a micro publisher, Hybrid Sequence Media, and they um, kind of fit right with what he, he wanted. You know, they do poetry and short story collections. Uh, I mean, you know, I'm sure he's also interested in you know if he finds a really good novel or novella, <clears throat> but. Uh, and that's been really good because I feel like it fits the the style of what they what they're looking for. And uh, one of the other ones I got to read is actually their newest release. It's called "Emotional Time Lapse" by Caitlin Charon, and um, it's it's actually really interesting because <clears throat> what Caitlin has done there is she's gone through all of her old notebooks, right, and her old diaries and stuff over the course of years going through 
um, the ups and downs of what it is to be human, right? You got uh, the stuff through being a teenager, early 20s, you know, the passing of a parent. And she's basically curated this this story. And it's not a, you know, it's not like a fictitious story. She's just curated by um, basically snippets out of all these journals and diaries. And it's just this really compelling book. So, you know, I was fortunate enough to to do see an advanced copy of that. And um, I mean, it released a couple of weeks ago and I Donald told me it was doing really well. So, but anyway, that's the kind of stuff that they like to publish, you know. So it worked out well because that, my stuff kind of felt is in that same same line of craziness. Awesome. Yeah, yeah. Um, tell me, is uh, is your dad still around? Yeah. Yeah, so he, yep, so I live in, in Boise, Idaho. Um, he, sorry, I dropped my thing there. He, uh, he moved to, he was in Salt Lake, which is about five hours from here on the freeway. And then he moved further south to the town he grew up in just uh, earlier, or I guess last year now. So yeah, we, we talked for occasionally and he, uh, or, you know, weekly we talk and he's doing well. He's kind of in, he's working from home last couple of years, got to get out of the city. And um, I haven't seen him or my grandpa in a long time because of COVID. You know, but hopefully this year things will smooth out a little bit because I want to get down there. Um, down in the desert, southern Utah is gorgeous. A lot of red and orange rocks and caves and a lot of uh, Native American ruins or, um, you know, huts built with cliffs and stuff. It's it's really cool stuff that we've explored. And, uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to that. And um, what's what's next for you what are you writing what's happening in your life what do you see how do you see things well you know so i've recently um stopped using my pseudonym which really wasn't a pseudonym it was just a lazy pseudonym <laughs> so my name is austin james hatch and up until now i've written under the name austin james um, and i've gone back and forth ever since I made that decision on whether or not I wanted to 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 go by my full name or my uh, I just always called it my lazy pseudonym um but you know with with everything that, that I've been through and I've changed a lot as a person in the last little bit you know last last year year and a half and I'm just barely starting to get back into writing again you know I took I not that I wanted to be away from it. I just did not have the desire. I needed that break, I guess. And so uh, I've changed it. I'm going to go by my full name now, Austin James Hatch, which is exciting for nobody. <laughs> it's just, it is for what you. it is. For me, yeah, it's just, I guess it's just, you know, I am a different person. My writing is different now. Um, so, so that's kind of a piece of news. Uh, other than that, upcoming, I do have a short story collection that will be published. Um, probably towards the end of this year, maybe beginning of next. That um, still working on some pieces for that, but I had a fairly decent kickoff, I guess, because some stuff I'd written before my mom passed. Um, and so I'm excited to be working on that. And in the writing world, that's kind of it. Uh, working on some stuff. Um, it's just good to be back. It's good to be doing it again. I. I'm glad that I kind of got over that hurdle of of not writing, you know. It's been rough, though. It's been really weird getting back into it, not just because of the rust after a year and a half or a year, if you count the poetry, um, because now I'm, I'm kind of back into fiction. But also, like, I'm, I'm different. I write differently. Um, my mind is different. <laughs> yeah, you know, and that's... You know, so I still, I'm still writing dark and weird and stuff. I suppose I'll always write. And, uh, you know, some of it is horror. Some of it is, well, it's probably all horror to some degree, depending on how you define it. Um, you know, I mean, I've got a zombie story, for example. Uh, but but it, I like it to have kind of a deeper meaning than a lot of my earlier stuff. Uh, and not to say my earlier stuff didn't have any depth to it. But... Um, you know, like just 
just raised the stakes a little bit. The stakes in my life changed, and so the stakes in my writing has changed, obviously, as well. <laughs> but, you know, even my thought process, like, I've discovered even even before my mom passed, even more so now, my writing is a little bit more meandering. It, it's a little bit more, uh, meandering is a bad word for it, but it's it sounds a lot more like the thoughts in my head sound. So, like, as you can tell, <laughs> I ramble a bit and I kind of switch topics or, you know, I kind of put two or three sentences together into one sentence. And so a lot of my writing does that now. And it's, um, but not, or at least based on the little bit of feedback I've had and based on my own opinion, not in a way that's harmful. It's actually in a way that I, I really enjoy. So I, I went from being what I called myself a minimalist, but I, I do. I tend to have a lot more commas now, longer sentences. So th that's been interesting. And like I said, I guess when I say it's rough getting back into writing stories and stuff, it's uh, it's just, uh, it's a different. It's, it's getting back in the groove of things. There's some rust, and then there's it's a little different than where I used to be. I used to have a, a set routine where I'm trying to adapt to my new lifestyle. Um, and But it's working. I'm getting some more done. I guess on, on, in other news, the, from what your question was earlier, I, uh, I am, I, I mentioned a novella that I was working on. You know, fortunate, fortunate enough that one of my teachers and mentors um, did a, kind of a beta read and pointed some stuff out and uh, did that while, like right after my mom died, I had a, it's actually a shitty draft. I never would let anybody read how crappy that draft was. <laughs> but I, I could tell, like, I'm not going to write for a while, but I don't want this to go away. So I explained that and good enough to go through and give me some pointers. And interestingly enough, um, the overall storyline and a lot of the stuff I had going on, he enjoyed. So at some point I'll get in and try to finish that novella up. Uh, yeah, and then this still, I mean, the theme of it is, is set toward a lot of the, the ways I think now and a lot of the, who I am now it easily be incorporated, I think. So, so, you know, eventually I'll have that done. Maybe, maybe somebody will publish that too. Maybe I will. I don't know. <laughs> um, I, I don't know if you know this. Do you know? I think you do know Sam Richards because he's also published. Yeah, oh yeah, I know Sam. Um, he has a, he's working on a podcast uh, about grief and creativity. Oh really? I did not know that. Yeah, I would get in touch with him because he's always looking for people who um have stories about that, and I think he's um still waiting to launch the podcast because he needs more chats. People who have used creativity during grief. Yeah, that that's actually excellent news. I I can't imagine going through what what Sam went through, you know, with his wife, and uh, you know, I've read some of this stuff, and I really like it. And uh, I actually had the um, honor because it was awesome. I got to meet him at Bizarro Con beginning of 2019. It was actually Bizarro Con for 2018, I think, but they. Uh, the schedule made it so I couldn't get there in Portland, but I was able to go anyway and uh, met Sam there, hung out with him a little bit. He's a he's an amazing guy. He's actually just really cool, laid back, funny, and uh, anyway, yeah, that's cool. I'm gonna reach out to him. It's good to know. You should do. Yeah, yeah. Shrapnel is out soon with Hybrid Sequence Media. Be on the lookout for that. Many thanks to Austin for such a lovely chat. If you would like to be on the show, if you want to tell me something about it, you can always do so using losingtheplotpodcast at gmail.com. And I look forward to hearing from you. That's all from me for this episode. So until next time, bye bye.